Hi everyone, my name is John Kennedy and I'm going to talk to you about working backwards from the customer. If you want to know more about the Amazon working backwards process, there's a great book uh, by Colin Breyer and Bill Carr called Working Backwards. I put a link here on the slide, you can go and check it out if you like. Really good uh, for understanding a little bit more context and history around the working backwards process. Today, we're going to talk about how you can do uh, customer research in a structured way that will flow directly into a uh, working backwards writing process. We're also going to talk about how to do that writing, how to create a pitch uh, in the uh, Amazon uh, writing style. And then additionally, we're going to talk a little bit about how that, uh, that doc that you write can help uh, you pivot a product. Uh, often docs are written for a product launch, uh, or a, a feature launch, but they can also be written uh, for a product pivot. So to kick it off, let's talk about customer research. Uh, every product uh, that Amazon launches starts with extensive customer research. And in fact, the minimum bar uh, for a product at Amazon is 25 to 50 customer conversations even before a document has its first review. Uh, that's a high bar, that's a lot of conversations. Uh, so, you know, there's a structured process you can use uh, to set up those conversations and get the data out that you need to start writing. Um, products that do follow this process all have, also have an added advantage in that uh, by building uh, relationships with those customers, you can have customers who are going to beta your product or even launch with your product and generate early revenue uh, in your product lifecycle. So a great way to get started contacting customers is to work with the team who contacts customers all the time, the sales team. It might be that your company has an enterprise sales team or a, a lean SaaS style sales team, or it might be that you're a CEO or a product manager who also wears the sales hat. Regardless, uh, when you want to set up customer meetings, it's great to, to get in the sales mindset. And what I do to help set up a pipeline is actually uh, create a spreadsheet. Now you can use a CRM as well to create a pipeline of customer conversations, but a simple spreadsheet uh, shared among people is uh, who, who would be doing those conversations is also a great way to start. It can be very simple, uh, just a list of companies who you wanna contact. If you're gonna try and have 25 to 50 customer conversations, you might need 100 to 200 names on that list. You can build that over time and update them uh, as you uh, have meetings or set up meetings. Um, just a very simple uh, pipeline is, is something that a lot of product managers miss. Uh, and uh, the reason is that you know, if you want to have that volume of conversations, uh, you've got to get uh, programmatic. So once you've got those, that list of uh, customers to contact, uh, the next thing you'll need is a good hook. Uh, so a hook is something that's going to get the customer interested in talking to you. And I have a structured way that I put together a hook uh, for uh, product conversations with customers. And it looks like this. So you can start off uh, by just expressing your respect for their time and expertise. You've probably chosen uh, the customer who you're contacting because uh, they have the problem you're talking about. Or you know, they are adjacent to the, the problem space that you're talking about. And so, uh, you know, a great way to start is to say something like, we're investigating problem space and recognize that you're an expert in this area or you, you, know, you deal with uh, this issue regularly. And then to go on, you can give them some context, best to be direct. Uh, we are considering building a service that, to solve uh, this problem or this type of problem. Um, we would love your input. Then you can offer some value. Uh, you know, with your participation, we can ensure that the service we build will solve your problem specifically. You can also offer a different type of value. You can offer them the opportunity to eventually be involved in the beta or even go as far as to offer an Amazon dis uh, a gift card or something like this. Uh, the direct approach uh, works for plenty of people. Um, so, you know, this kind of pitch can be used in an email or a LinkedIn message, or even if you're reaching out through the sales team, if you give a salesperson a really uh, punchy hook, they can actually put that into their own communication and that can help you get conversations. So for the first uh, customers you contact, you want to be asking open questions that's going to enable the customer to tell their story. So an open, a good example of an open question 
uh, for a storage product uh, that targets on-premise storage might be something like, how do you store your data on-premises today? And with that question, a customer is going to be able to tell their story. And uh, you know, it may only be that you need uh, only five questions to fill a, a half an hour to an hour phone call because what you want to do for each of these questions is really dive into that story and understand the pain points uh, and get some technical detail uh, as you're going through uh, you know, these questions. And what that should yield to you over a number of customer conversations is a set of uh, problems. So uh, the notes uh, that you take uh, for these conversations are, are, are really important. Um, these conversations become a record that you can lay, use later for various purposes. And some of the things that I've found interesting to keep as a part of the notes are uh, surprisingly simple. Uh, the email addresses, you might have one contact customer. If you get everyone's email address from the call, you can do a follow up and potentially make more contacts at that customer and build relationships with those people. Uh, problem statements, um, you know, it's great to have free form notes or stream of consciousness notes, but if you can also write out problem statements that, of the problems those customers had, that's going to help you uh, organize your custom notes later. And then quotes. If the customer has a, has a, really, uh, a really clear pain point, they might give you a great quote around that pain point, and that's going to help you later on. Once you've identified those big customer problems, you want to, the common problems across many customers, you then want to start asking quantitative questions to understand the value you might deliver by solving those problems. So a great quantitative question along the same theme uh, for data storage on-prem might be, how much data do you store on-premises and in the cloud? And this is going to give you probably an answer in terabytes or something like this, but it's allowing you to estimate the value of the problem. Uh, you can ask directly, you can ask a customer how much they pay for a particular solution. Sometimes that's a little harder to get from them. Or you can ask indirectly uh, if they can tell you the size of the team uh, that manages a, a certain issue for them. That's a good proxy for how much they're spending on a problem right now. What you should end up with after uh, you know asking a number of uh, customers these quantitative questions, and you shouldn't just ask three, <laughs> uh, you know, you, should, you want to have uh, at least kind of 20 answers for these types of questions to get a, get a good sample of customers. Um, but it should give you an understanding of the size of, of the, the problems that you're uh, going, you could possibly address for customers. So once you've got all that research together, it's time to start writing. And, uh, you know, I have a, a uh, uh, process that I use rather than going directly to a peer FAQ, which is the standard Amazon format for product launches. Uh, I start out with a messaging framework. So we're going to talk about that in a second, but to start with, to understand why uh, Amazon writes, um, you know, the, the reason is to lower the cognitive load for a decision maker who might be uh, giving you headcount for uh, the product you want to, you want to build and launch or the feature you want to build and launch. Um, and so uh, putting the writing in a standard format helps with that. Also being clear, concise, and direct, explaining without technical jargon, using correct punctuation and grammar, very important, and uh, using consistent terms, also very important uh, when, you're, when you're writing. So let's talk about that uh, intermediate uh, format that I use uh, called a, a messaging framework. This is before we write the peer FAQ. Uh, we can start out by asking some simple questions. So you've just spoken to a lot of customers uh, and you found out their common problems. Uh, the uh, problems won't be evenly distributed across all the customers. You'll have certain problems that certain types of customers have. For your biggest problems, you want to identify the types of organizations that have those biggest, hardest problems that are worth solving. And then you can identify the type of organization who you think is going to be your customer. And that could be a couple of different types. Uh, but you can write it out here in the messaging framework. From there, you can write down the end user. So, you know, the customer probably has a, a role type who's going to actually use a potential solution uh, to this problem. And then the problem statement. Uh, the example here, customers need access to petabytes of data storage on premises uh, is a very simple statement. It's the, the high level uh, big picture issue that customers are experiencing.
And from there, we can break it down into the top customer issues. So as you've had those conversations with customers, you should have started to see uh, the pattern that there are very specific issues within that larger issue, uh, the example being data storage that they have. Uh, and I've got some examples here. So we can talk about uh, the fact that on-premise on premises storage is limited. Um, some data sets need to be accessible in both the cloud and on-premise. And uh, the management of infrastructure is uh, time consuming, it's a management burden. So this is the, the breakdown of the three biggest issues. Once you really understand uh, you know, those high value issues that you're gonna be addressing with a product or a feature or a pivot, uh, you can then uh, talk to the engineering team about how you might address those issues. Uh, so you've worked backwards from the customer problem and now you're talking solutions. So uh, you know, there might be various technical approaches that you could use to address these problems. Uh, but uh, you know, in talking with the engineering team, you should be able to find a good theory about the set that you're going to use. And of course, you can review these with lots of people later, uh, but you can take, uh, take a stance on what, those, uh, on what the technology should be to address those issues to begin with. Once you've got those technical approaches or the what, uh, you can think about how that actually addresses the customer issue, how you would, uh, how you would state uh, you know, the, the value, uh, the technical value that you're providing. So in the case of uh, feature one, which is the, the, the cache on premises for cloud storage, it's cached access to cloud data that addresses the issue uh, uh, you know, of limited um, storage on premises. And, uh, and it could be access to um, SMB and NFS endpoints on premises and in the cloud uh, that gives that symmetric access to data. So these are examples now of features rather than the, just the technology. So this is the how we address the issue. And from there, you can drive the customer benefit. Uh, you know, so that cached access is gonna give you unlimited on-premises data storage. So you, think, you can see how we've worked from the customer problem uh, to the solution and then backwards into the customer benefit. So you really understand the why now. The final thing for the messaging framework is the getting started uh, steps. And this is just a way to break down how a customer would use the product. Um, and, and it's really useful to have this. Anyone technical reading a document is gonna get a lot out of the getting started uh, steps. It will help them understand the product. So then you've got uh, overall the messaging hierarchy and we haven't talked about the one sentence value proposition yet. Um, but this is really the last thing you write. Um, it could become uh, your head or subhead or a first sentence. Um, this is really once you understand uh, the, the, the benefits, all of those three customer benefits that you're providing, you should be able to write a one sentence value proposition that really encapsulates the value you're providing uh, with the product feature or pivot that you are proposing. So from that messaging hierarchy, we can then get started working on the actual document uh, that we would use for review. You can keep the messaging hierarchy in an appendices. Uh, it can be useful to have a structured uh, you know, a template or a spreadsheet down there to explain certain parts. Uh, but the document that, uh, that Amazon would use predominantly for product launches, et cetera, is a peer FAQ. And a peer FAQ is a narrative um, it's a document that, uh, that is uh, very structured um, and uh, this is the structure that, I've, that, uh, that you can see here is the standard structure used by Amazon. Uh, so you start with your heading and subheads. You've got one, the, the first paragraph is a summary paragraph. Uh, you know, if there was uh, one person, if uh, a person was only going to read uh, one paragraph, this should be able to give them all the information they need. Uh, and then into the problems, the solutions, lead a quote, getting started, etc. You can start to see how this maps back to the messaging framework that we just discussed. So uh, digging in on the heading and subheads, um, you know, can be very simple. The heading can just be company announces product code name. Product code name names are important during the uh, research and pitching process because you don't want to bias uh, the people who are who are reviewing your product with. Uh, an actual name with a descriptive or a suggestive name. Having a product code name that could just be the name of a fictional spaceship or a plant is going to help uh, help people keep a, a, an open mind about what the product could be. Uh, the subhead, you can use the uh, one sentence value prop uh, or uh, just a template like this. Product description enables key customer benefit. Uh, 
um, right at the top. And then uh, for your subhead two, uh, you can actually uh, take the org type that you had in the messaging framework and, uh, and think about uh, some of the key customers of that org type you might want as customers. And this can help a reader understand the type of customers that you uh, think are suitable for the product. So coming down to the paragraph one for the PRFAQ, you can see uh, this structure here. Uh, this is a good example. You don't necessarily have to use this structure, um, but the first sentence should really encapsulate the value. Um, here's a template that I use. Uh, today, company announced product code name, and then the description of the product, that's really the what, uh, that makes it simple for primary user role, and you can get take that from your messaging framework to do the thing. Uh, to get the value. Um, you can then explain the product further. Customers can use the product to gain specific big claim value. Uh, you know, you can make a big claim there, you have to be able to support it. Um, and, uh, and then maybe with product code names, easy for customers to, and you can go into specific functionality. So you might take the three, uh, the three uh, capabilities or uh, features that you've written and explain them in very briefly in the first uh, sentence. Then great to finish off with the sentence uh, that just describes how you're going to get started uh, with the product. So paragraph two is where you describe uh, the problem that you've identified. Uh, first, you described the, the, the top level problem. You could do that um, by saying something like customers in these industries listing out the industries are experiencing this top level problem. Uh, you don't want to uh, talk much about competitors. You don't want to get too negative. Um, you know, this is meant to be explaining the world's it, world as it is. Uh, so, uh, you, so that, uh, you know, you can then uh, extrapolate on that by explaining each of the issues uh, that you've uh, discovered during customer research, taking them straight from the messaging framework uh, you can then, you need to then link those issues together in a narrative so they flow so it's easy to read, um, but you can take them directly from the messaging framework. Once you've explained uh, the problems that customers are experiencing, you can then uh, write the solution paragraph. And, you know, I've come up with a really formulaic way to write the solution paragraph. There are lots of ways to write this, um, you know, and I think that um, it's, more interesting if you go beyond the template and and write in a way that's compelling and punchy um, but this can be a great starting point so you want to start out your first sentence uh, with describing what the product is so product code name is the description um, and it provides this specific value and then uh, from your messaging framework you can take the differentiated features and match them up with the customer benefits and so your, your next three sentences, you can really just follow those columns. And different, differentiated feature one provides customer benefit one, uh, and so forth. So after you've written up uh, the, uh, the solution paragraph, um, uh, a great next step is to write a quote from one of your leaders. This really does two things. One, it, makes you, it gives you the opportunity to make a big claim in a conversational voice. And two, it also gives your leader the opportunity to insert their own voice into this pitch. So, uh, you know, as this pitch either goes further up, uh, your, you know, the, the chain of command in your company, or um, if you're going to use this publicly, uh, you know, they can have their voice um, in, in the press release. This should capture the why for the customer. So uh, the last paragraph uh, of the press release is the getting started paragraph. And this is really where someone technical will look to really understand what the product is. If you can describe how a user would get started with the product, um, that's often a really good way to understand the product technically. So you can take this once again straight from the messaging framework. Uh, you want to join each of these steps together so they're easy to understand, easy to read, um, but really simple paragraph uh, to help people understand the product. From there, um, having two to three compelling customer quotes can be a really powerful way to finish off the PR. So, uh, you know, these customer quotes should encapsulate uh, one, you know, for, for each customer quote, it should encapsulate one of those columns. Uh, so it describes the, the customer benefit in the voice of the customer uh, and focusing on the impact to their business. 
So to, stand, to follow the standard format, then you've got the frequently asked questions. And there are a set of standard questions you can ask that'll help um, expand the description of the product. Uh, so you can really dive to the next, uh, next layer of detail with these questions. What are you launching? Who should use it, uh, etc. cetera. Um, but you're still staying uh, in, you know, in the voice uh, of, uh, of speaking to the customer. So you're answering these as if you were answering them across the table to a customer. Um, and, you know, internal, uh, internal uh, FAQs we'll talk about in a second. Uh, these are the ones that you really couldn't answer to a customer, but you, as much as you can, you want to answer questions to a customer because that means that there's as, as low context as possible and that's gonna make it easier to read for everyone in your company. So anyone reading this, if they can uh, read the answer like a, a customer would read the answer, then they don't need kind of any of the technical context next necessary or any other context uh, around the product. So uh, beyond the standard questions, um, you should be taking questions that you've actually discovered during your customer research and answer them in the uh, PR. And this could be uh, you know, the research that you've done with customers, it could be the discussions you've had within, uh, with technical staff internally or marketing or finance or sales. Uh, you know, all of those groups can provide really good questions uh, that you can answer in the FAQ. And that helps everyone understand the product more thoroughly. And then finally, uh, internal FAQs. So these are things that you really couldn't answer to a customer, things like market size or competitive offerings, uh, you know, the P&L, uh, if you've got uh, uh, you know, a, a theory around uh, the, the P&L to start with. Uh, you could work with finance and come up with something really sophisticated, but often early in the process, uh, when you're finding approvals, a lot of it is going to be speculation. And so best just to have a summary. Right, so that's uh, the standard structure of a peer FAQ, um, you know, end of the messaging framework that can help you get there. Um, and now I'm going to talk about, uh, you know, and, and that structure is often used to get approvals for a product launch or a, or a feature launch. But now we're going to talk a little bit about how you can use uh, that process of customer research and um, the standard format of a peer FAQ to help or to pivot, um, you know, a, 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 any given product. So you've gone through that process of research, you've built the artifact, which is the peer FAQ. And by the way, you know, another way you could do this is you've done the customer research, as I was saying before, and then you could create some other type of artifact. It doesn't have to be a pure FAQ. It could be a document, it could be a presentation. But in this case, we're gonna talk about using a pure FAQ. Um, and then uh, when you go to Pivot, you can use that artifact uh, to communicate clearly and broadly uh, to the organization. So once you've had approval for uh, the Pivot, uh, you can take that artifact to the wider organization so they can understand the why and the how and the what. Uh, you know, Pivoting uh, a product is a huge undertaking, uh, often harder than launching a product. And so really establishing the why with everyone is very important. And as much as you can tell people in meetings or you can announce uh, through public announcements or emails, uh, having a living document that people internally in the, org in the organization can go back to, to understand the why and the what is really powerful. So. First step is building that artifact. Second step, reviewing widely and broadly so everyone understands this and making the link to this artifact available so people can go back to it if they need to. And then creating a closed loop process uh, for, for the reprioritization of work. You know, so uh, in building your product, uh, you know, you've built a roadmap. People uh, downstream of that have made plans. Those could be engineering plans or marketing plans or sales plans. There's a whole range of activity uh, that revolves around uh, the product strategy and, uh, and changing that product strategy, changing your product really requires everyone to think about that. And that's a difficult problem. So it really is a, a program management problem of working out every, uh, every plan that's affected uh, by the pivot and then tracking those plans and helping people adjust their plans. And then finally, uh, you know, once you've executed this, the, the pivot, uh, gathering ongoing sprint data to, uh, to understand if you've uh, actually made the pivot, if there are any leftover uh, processes that need to be adjusted. Uh, time and time again, I've seen 
uh, companies go through a pivot and then uh, still have old, uh, you know, uh, processes running that, um, you know, were in service of the previous goal. Uh, it's hard to have people let go of specific goals they have. They might have career goals attached to some of the, the uh, tasks there, um, you know, and uh, it, it's important to take people through uh, through the why, how, and what, so they understand why they're moving, but also then ongoing, uh, just have a set of checks and balances to make sure that everyone is on board uh, with the new vision. So that's about it for uh, the presentation today. Thank you for listening. I hope you got something out of it. Um, if you'd like to know more, feel free to reach out uh, on email or LinkedIn. Really happy to answer questions about the presentation today. Uh, thanks for coming along.